let, let me open the slides. Prim, can you share the slides? I don't know what's happening to my computer. Wait one second. Because I'm opening so many tabs at the same time. I'll, I'll log in again with my iPad and see if I can share the slides right. with my iPad. I, I can share for or, you if you like. Uh, um, you yeah, if, if that's fine with you, then, then can you please? Sure, sure. Thank you. I think it's in the folder. Yeah, I found it. Um, I just need to move it to notability. Okay, uh, can you see now? Um, no. Oh, okay. Now I do. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay. So, our case today is a US case from the Federal Trade Commission. And it's a case on a company called IDEX Laboratories. So to touch on the background of this case for a little bit. Um, respondent IDEX is a Delaware Incorporated Corporation and its place of business is in the state of Maine. Its business is to develop, manufacture and sell diagnostic products and services to companion animal vet veterinarians. So basically companion animal is like animal kept as pet or domesticated animals like cat, dogs, birds, <laughs> small animals. And IDEX core business is companion animal diagnostics, which includes point of care instruments and the related consumables, rapid as test, which is basically like the, um, the tool you use to diagnose any diseases on the point like or where the patient is at the place of the clinic um like like the COVID-19 rapid test kits where you can have the results immediately so basically that is what point of care diagnostic product is and in terms of the company size IDEX worldwide operations 2011 revenue is 1.2 billion dollars in which 700 million of it was from the sales only in the u.s particularly companion animal diagnostic business produced revenues for 2011 of approximately 600 million dollars so it's basically like the very main business in the u.s for idex 
And most veterinarians buy a majority of their equipment and supplies from a preferred distributor. So they do not buy from IDEX directly, but rather from a distributor because of the efficiency, the cheaper price, and the customer service offered by the distributors. And while IDEX and other POC diagnostic product manufacturers use distributors as well, because it is the most effective effective way to channel their products to veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And in the picture, you will see five main distributors. And the distributor with the red square on is the national distributor, like the very big distributors in the US. So one interesting fact that I would like to point out is that manufacturers who don't use distributors will face more significant obstacles to sales, marketing, and delivery than manufacturers who use distributors. And Butler, MWI, and Webster, the distributor in this picture, are recognized by manufacturers, distributors, and veterinarians as the preeminent companion animal supply distributors in the U.S. There are no other distributors, this is according to the FTC, There are no other distributors that provide equivalent levels of service to manufacturers and regularly visit veterinarians in as a wide geographic area as these three national distributors. While Midwest and VMZ is like um, region regional distributors, but it's um, five of them combined make up like 85% of the products sold to veterinarians in the U.S. So it is a pretty big market for IDEX. So what IDEX did in this particular case is that it has contracted with these main five distributors. There are other distributors, but in the FTC file, they um, mentioned these five big distributors. So IDEX contract with its distributor to sell IDEX products to veterinarians and other users. Each firm's contract stated that IDEX may discontinue providing a category of products to the distributor if the distributor sells any product with, um, that competes with an IDEX product within the category. So basically, it excluded the distributors from distributing the competing um, products. Mm. So that will be the background of this case, which instigate an investigation from the FTC. So the FTC has provided a market definition in um, in its filing. I mean, the, the information that they gave out about the case. So first we'll look at the relevant product market on the left. Um, the relevant product market where IDEX conduct was evaluated includes the development, manufacture, and sale of point of care diagnostic products. And within that whole um, circle, there um, the FTC also identified the narrow relevant market contained within the development, manufacture, and sale of point of care diagnostic products. And in that narrow relevant market includes a rapid assay single use test kits and a diagnostic instruments and the associated single use products combined their core consumables designed for in clinic testings of biological sample. And the whole circle in um, the big picture is collectively called the relevant POC markets. So the FTC has um, categorized quite, I mean, they don't give out the reason why they divided into um, the big relevant market and then they have a narrow relevant market. But um, I assume that it is to precisely define the market power of IDEX in this case. And in, in the right of the slide, we are looking at the geographic market in this case. Well, basically IDEX is a worldwide corporation. It has uh, sales all over the world, but in this case, the FTC only considers the geographic market in the 48 states of the continental United States. 
And the FTC also mentioned that um, the primary consumer of PLC diagnostic products um, are the companion animal veterinarians. And in 2009, data shows that more than 75 of the veterinarian in the U.S., I assume that is the continental U.S., use POC diagnostic testing. And the value of that use is uh, approximately 500 million U.S. dollars of purchase. Well, um, I would like to mention the fact that U.S. antitrust legislation does not establish a prerequisite for market definition or even a methodology of for its application, but an obligation to define the relevant market was actually established by the judiciary. So basically, the Supreme Court has several decisions stating that um, the relevant market must be defined in order to establish the market power of the, the subject of the business. And um, moving on to the next slides, this is like a, um, to take a closer look to the relevant product market, the FTC also provide data that um, after considering the development, manufacture and sale of point of care diagnostic products, they found that there are no close substitutes for these POC diagnostic products. And even if um, it is found that veterinarians can still purchase the diagnostic service from a third party labs by sending the samples to outside lab, but the outside lab service are not considered substitute for POC diagnostic products. The reason was not provided in the FTC decision but our assumption is that because veterinarians value fast results and um, the, the comparability between having the result by using the diagnostic products and sending the result to an outside lab is quite a different nature of service and products. So on the right hand side, we just include like um, a landmark Supreme Court decision that state that the relevant market must include all products interchangeable by customers for the same purpose. So in this case, we are assuming that the purpose of sending the sample to outside lab and the purpose of um, diagnosing the disease by using our diagnostic products is different. Um, but we would like to point some interesting fact, um, fact well, let's say a uh, legal development that we found recently that in some modern decisions, um, the court did not particularly focus on the relevant market or the market definition that much, but instead the court used um, direct evidence of monopoly power and suggest that the evidence could eliminate the need to define the relevant market. Yeah. But the problem with this is that it is very case specific and require a thorough examination of the circumstances of each case and which might lead to some kind of uncertainty in determining whether a firm is violating antitrust law or not. So that's an interesting point that we found. Yeah. So, yeah, moving yeah. on. You're done with your part, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, to wrap up with, with, with what Prawa has said, uh, basically we the F FTC has established that IDEX has a monopoly power over the POC market, and it was alleged by the FTC that IDEX has used this monopoly power to create a competitive harm over the, the market. Uh, th Particularly, it was because um, the the explicit agreements that that uh, forces other the the distributors to go into an exclusive dealing agreement with um, with IDEX has barred other distributors from competition into this POTC diagnostic and testing products. It's it's 
the the FTC has used the term all or nothing choice. This means that that basically distributors who want to distribute IDEX's products can only have an exclusive dealing with IDEX and no other uh, POC manufacturers that are competitors of IDEX. So like. Because IDEX is such a, such a main player in in the market, most distributors would choose to only opt in and sell products off um, IDEX and not other distributors. And this this economic incentive that other other distributors or the distributors in in this case has has opt in for then causes this this unfair dealing. Yeah, so it's like it's all or nothing choice and it has it i bears a status as a must carry supplier and and it has insisted on exclusivity and yeah thank you for that and yeah it's also important to to like emphasize on the fact that veterinarians would prefer to buy diagnostic products from these top tier distributors because it's more efficient and less costly to do so now to to understand deeply like uh, in the the claims at least by the claimant or the FTC is that um, it's, is that edex has has like threatened that it will cut off the supply of all categories of its products and terminate its contract with the distributor if the distributor sells or promotes any competing product in the relevant POC market. So so this this is what the FTC has used in alleging that this this practice of exclusive uh, demanding exclusivity and this all or nothing policy has give distributors very powerful economic incentives to only deal with IDEX on an exclusive basis. And this as a result has created barriers to entry for the manufacturers. And this also falls under like uh, monopolization under uh, Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Um, there are two main elements of monopolization under the Sherman Act. And the first one being possession of monopoly power in the relevant market. And the second being the willful acquisition, enhancement or maintenance of that power through exclusionary conduct and and so so this this very very definition like this very action committed by idex then fulfills both elements and it can be char characterized as monopolization on the, the sherman act and also like there has been a decision in in the aspen skiing co versus aspen highland skiing corp that defined exclusive dealing so in this case, exclusive dealing by a monopolist is condemned when the challenge conduct um, significantly impairs the ability of rivals to compete effectively within the respondent with the respondent and thus limits the ability of those rivals to constrain the exercise of monopoly power. When it's clear in our case that that the exclusive dealing by like the threaten the threat to terminate a uh, relationship and everything that uh, the all or nothing choice that I mentioned earlier uh, can be characterized as exclusive dealing because because the it impairs all the distributors uh, ability to to compete. I'm sorry, it it um. It impairs the ability, the ability of other competitors in the market, like competitors of IDEX, to compete within within that relevant market, and and it encourages uh, IDEX to exercise its monopoly power. So th this is the allegation that that IDEX was facing, and the order by the FTC is that uh, there are five five main things that it was that was imposed. First of all, um, IDEX was prohibited from maintaining exclusive distribution arrangements. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> with all three national distributors. And secondly, uh, it was required to report, like it was, it was obliged to have like reporting requirements for four years. Thirdly, 
it also had like reporting and compliance requirements. And fourthly, the some some of the distributors, uh, the MWI, it can only distribute both IDEX products. It, it can distribute both IDEX products and competitive products. And either IDEX and MWI can terminate the agreement. This means that the the exclusive deal or the, the exclusivity requirement that was earlier imposed by IDEX can like it can no longer be maintained. And to add on to that, like if the parties agree that MWI will return to an exclusive arrangement with IDEX, IDEX must have a non-exclusive arrangement with one of the two other national distributors. This this leaves like a choice open that like that makes it nearly impossible for for IDEX to have exclusive power uh, to only have um, exclusive power or impose exclusive requirements over their distributors. And last one is that the all the other non-exclusive agreements between IDEX and the national distributor must meet requirements of the order. And this requirements is like the evidence that FTTC has in a way used its power to to uh, impede into like private businesses. So like these requirements are, for example, um, the agreement like the distribution agreement must begin with a two year term. And they must also provide for additional renewal terms of at least one year. So this is like a time requirement of how the contract is supposed to go for. Because in a lot of industries, like it might be clear, not in like the POC industry, but maybe like in automobile industry, where where distributors would would most likely like have to invest in a large amount of cost in order to become the distributor of a certain product. And once they do so, if there's if the contract is going to be terminated in such a short uh, period of time, then it's like it's not worth it because they already invested so much in becoming the distributor. So this two year requirement locks that like kind of ensures that distributors will not like be spending so much amount for nothing. Uh, secondly, IDEX must limit its sales of other manufacturers must not limit its sales of other manufacturers products. And IDEX must notify the FTC about the termination of any non-exclusive dis distribution agreement. IDEX must show any future non-exclusive distribution agreement to the Commission at least 30 days before it is signed. And um, if the national, if um, if the non-exclusive national distributor merges or acquires or is acquired by a distributor that has an exclusive distribution agreement with IDEX, then the non-exclusive distribution agreement would still st stay in effect. So it, it, I think like, like in my opinion, I think like the, the FTC decision focuses mainly on on uh, preventing IDEX from going into exclusive relationships with with other distributors by opening a, a like a choice or like creating requirements that that from now on the future uh, c contractual relationships that IDEX will e establish with dealers would have to mainly be non-exclusive agreements so that uh, there can be competition within the POC market itself. And yeah, that's, that's mainly what I have. <laughs> Good job. Any ideas or comments from you, um, the other two? Can we chew it and go to know what? Any idea? What do you think? Any points were discussed? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. But I think the person, the person, pretty clear. So I think I don't, I don't have a question. Okay, good. Uh, so well, this is quite clear, right? It's exclusive dealing, uh, with an intention to foreclose other businesses. 
especially uh, the competitors of this IDX laboratory. Um, but as you probably saw in the lecture, um, the sort of more recent approach to this vertical things has been more lenient, right? If they, they, are, they are allowing more and more cases of these vertical uh, restraints. And one of the reasons because, I mean, judging from the rules of reason, um, well, there are so many possibilities of having more efficiency by doing this, right? Um, you know what? Very similar cases happening now in Thailand uh, in the OTCG. Um, there is an attempt to, but it's not really exclusive dealing. Um, there was still an option provided. Um, one of these food delivery platform, they uh, they're trying to provide two alternatives to restaurants. Okay, first thing is okay. I, I'm just let's go with the standard contract. And um, I think the, the, the level commission is about like 30% or something. OK, um, but if you exclusively sign a contract with us, we're going to give you some sort of sort of extra benefit, right? Um, the, the, the commission could be lower than 30, maybe 20 or 15%. But you have to commit to us not to other deliver, delivery um, platforms. So um, that's ongoing, and the case is actually in the hand of the of the OTCC, and it's really difficult for them to make a decision. But um, and one of the main reasons is because okay, one thing the, the main difference is if you look at this case, this is like eighty five percent of products sold to the to the vets in the US, right? And this is quite huge. And this is something, it's all or nothing, right? It's not like in the case of Thailand where you provide an alternative and it's, it remains pretty much the choice of distributor. Not distributor, but suppliers. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you can think as you can think of restaurants as in the same uh, position as the distributors as well, right? It's just um, on the opposite side. So if you have to represent ITEX in this case, what can you do better? Or what you would what would you do differently? I mean, you having this benefit from knowing the result of it, right? If you have to represent IDEX and you want to make it better, what do you think you can do it differently? Maybe IDEX can expand its market definition here yeah, right i think i think they were trying already uh, probably the alternative that they provided was was this um external lab which um the ftc disagreed but yet yeah, i mean one 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 possibility is definitely trying to expand the market and say that, you know what, um, look, I know that I'm, I'm having these distributors, but even if without these distributors, um, vets can still have access to these POC from elsewhere anyway, or exactly the same sort of service, right? This is not POC per se, but um, they can still get these um, tastes from somewhere else as well. What else? I think like their problem is also because they they made it so explicit that they they are only the exclusive dealer, like like it was written in their contract terms and everything, so it was very clear and very easy to be unleashed. So I think like I don't know personally if I were to advise IDEX, then I would I would like instead of instead of uh, having such explicit contractual terms maybe try to create some kind of incentive instead so it would seem more as if like okay. the, the the distributors opt in like with consent <laughs> i don't know if that's like still um unlawful under competition law or not but we'll provide some sort of concept incentive right 
yeah, like some kind of incentive like, OK, if you, you the original agreement is non-exclusive, but if you choose to be exclusive, then there would be like this some kind of like economic incentive. So it's sort of make it optional. Yeah, because I think the gist of this this case is that it they had the distributors had no choice. They, they can't just not distribute for IDEX because it, they have such a broad product line and all the veterinarians like obviously want to use IDEX's products. But at the same time, they can go for, like with this such with such uh, contractual limitation, they can uh, opt in to become the distributor for other uh, other players in the market as well. OK, OK, yeah. Um, what else? What else could you do? I mean, it's, now you, you we, we, well, when it comes to this sort of relationship, um, mostly, what would you do now is like, okay, this is um, the ultimate goal is to say that we don't have market power, right? Saying that, well, actually, um, that still, I mean, still have um, alternatives out there. I mean, they can still just um, purchase or get the same sort of services from somewhere else. And this is pretty much the same as well that, well, you know what, um, this is not something that is mandatory. So we are not, we are not exercising our market power. But what, what else can you do when you, when you talk about this, especially when it comes to rule of reason? That's another side of the coin, right? So IDEX maybe want to say that, um, in the exclusive dealing have a pro-competitive effect okay. to, to, counter, to counter the anti-competitive effects. Right, such as? Yeah. Um. Uh, any input from the other group? If you, because you were working on essentially um, the same thing, right? I mean, it's just the piano industry, but um, essentially you talk about this vertical restraints as well. But, okay. When, when you when you are entering into this sort of contractual relationship and say the for a certain period, what do you get from it? Like, for example, if you have this sort of long term trade partners, uh, what is the difference between having this sort of well same trading partners for the next ten years or twenty years, and the situation in which you would have to keep changing your trading partners? There should be some differences here, right? I think the investment is also important. Like, mm -hmm. like I think I've read something about um, like, uh, di distributorship in the automobile industry, mm -hmm. where like if you, I don't know if it, this would apply to our case, but most of the time when say one company deci decides to be a di distributor of of a certain car brand, like for example, if they choose to become the showroom for Benz, for example, they would need to like invest in such a large amount of money to meet the standards of Benz in order to become their like approved distributor and to sell their their products. So like, if if the contractual term is only for a short while, then then they would be like investing in so much money to meet the, the requirements, but only be able to be the distributor distributor for such a short amount of time that like like the investment is not going to be worthwhile yeah so like these these distributors would prefer to to have a longer relationship with like the manufacturer yeah uh that is that is why you like um like Millennium Auto, right? Um, 
that they 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 they, they are um, authorized dealers of BMW and um, the Mini Coopers, right? And so so that essentially that the, the part is you you would need to do some sort of QC or um, some sort of this um, quality control process, and you need some sort of an investment in that and. Yeah, I mean, you can you can say that as well, right? Uh, in the sense that I would need to put some sort of money up front, and um, that would guarantee that okay, say Butler, how do you pronounce it? Butler. Yeah, probably. <laughs> whatever it is, okay. And um, MWI and Webster, right? So so you can say that um, you know what. Um, we, we need to do some sort of initial investment in order to guarantee that, okay, these distributors are up to the standard. We work together with them. And if you allow um, other competitors, I mean, other laboratories to essentially um, using the same distributors, then they're going to be free riding on our resources. And that will create a sort of unfair advantage as well. If you can provide that argument or even better evidence for that, then that would be um, what I want to try to say is now you are coming from the other side, right? You're saying that this is actually increased efficiency, right? This is actually um, make the whole process better, not just that you don't have market value. Well, an another thing is, yeah, you were saying, you want to say something? Yes. Okay, now you turn off your mic. Um, but you, you can talk about um, one one classic argument that they often use, and uh, maybe I, I, I might use myself is, you know what? Um, there must be certain scale of this um, production, right? To be um, to make it cheap, and I need certain level of guarantee that. Well, if I produce this amount of um, POC, for example, like a uh, million units, I need to any certain cer I need some certainty that I would be able to distribute all of these in time. And too specific, especially if you say the POC is something that is um, the well, how do you call it? Um, the is usage usage period is not that long, right? In the sense that uh, it could be kept just for a certain period and then the quality will deteriorate so quickly. So if you can if you can prove that, it basically means that you need some sort of certainty and that is why you need this sort of exclusive dealing. Because so suppose that you some, something happened and you say that, okay, I need to distribute this million unit in the next week or in the next two months. And then your distributors say that, oh, well, well, we can't do that because uh, we have to allocate certain slot for the other um, suppliers. And then supplier, yeah, but, but uh, producers, right? So if, if you can find the evidence to prove that, um, so that certainty would allow you to create in a larger scale. And when you create in a larger scale, the unit, I mean, the unit cost would be lower, right? And that is what we call the economies of scale as well. So you can say that, yeah, I mean, by having certainty, you would um, be able to produce more and that would create the economy of scales. And eventually um, the end consumers are the one who benefit from this. But this is possible. This is one possible argument as well. And this is from the efficiency side. And what else? What else do you think you can make in order to? Because in this case, they 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 essentially the loss, right? So if you if you can help them and make it better, what can you do?
Um, I don't know if this will work, but IDEX maybe can argue that the competitors can still, I mean, approach other distributors or maybe approach like the veterinarians directly. I mean, there are other ways to distribute their products without distributors. They can. So, I think one attempt that you can try is to, because now um, when to market, and that, that is actually something you need to trade off as well, right? Um, generally, the idea is you want to make these um, geographic market to be as broad as possible. But if that is the case, it means that you cannot include any sort of local player. It's going to be more difficult to include local player, right, in in in, in the market, because um, but this case, the benefit of it is suppose that you take this geographic market as given, it's at the state level, or right? seventy forty seven um, geographic markets, if I understand correctly. Um, well, you can say that oh, for each state, there are still local players, local producers who can um, directly distribute um, their own products. Or um, you can find other distributors who are not specialized in, in this uh, veterinary um, supply, right? You can find that some other distributors who are more capable, who are also capable of distributing this product. The, this is what we call supply substitution, right? You, you you can you can you can find it. Okay, I know that these um, distributors are specialized in this um, wet supply, but um, I also know that if you are supposed that you are distributing um, what um, medical devices or well some sort of similar hygienic product or what, uh, and you can actually jump into the market and be the I mean be an alternative to to these distributors as well, right? And again, that, well, that, I think that is something that um, IDEX can use as well, right? And I think they use, you, you see that, okay, there's a, actually a supply substitute. So when you, when you say that the, the agreement has been written so explicitly that, okay, this is all or nothing, right? Uh, one possibility you say like I know that the agreement has been written so explicitly and this is essentially an exclusive dealing but it has no impact on the market right because whenever I do this I force the, this for coaster essentially someone can jump into the market quite easily that's possible so uh, you were raising your hand right thank you it yes please uh, yes I I don't know uh, if it uh, okay, about its argument. Uh, can we argue that uh, by uh, by using this a exclusive uh, like a exclusivity uh, uh, clause or anything, it will encourage a the exclusive distributor themselves to uh, compete among themselves and also like uh, at the end benefit the the consumer. Mm. Ooh, right. Uh, you mean by putting them into essentially um, under the umbrella of IDEX, then they would have to competing. I mean, they have to compete against themselves in order to win IDEX heart or that sort of thing. It would uh, can can you repeat that again? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm trying to understand your, your, your answer is like, okay, now there are two scenarios, right? Um, one scenario is a situation in which this Butler, MWI and Webster, for example, because they are national level. Well, they, they can choose whether they would um, distribute for IDEX so they can be um, distributing for some other laboratory. Right, this is one possibility. But now because of this exclusive dealing, they would have to serve IDEX only. And by having this second scenario, that would intensify the competition. Right? Is that is that what you were trying to argue? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. And 
it like it it may be also like it will help expand the market like to for example to Canada <laughs> maybe okay in the sense that well in the sense of, well okay so you are you trying to say that by having this sort of exclusive relationship it would uh, sort of allow these distributors to distribute outside or to expand the scope of their distribution network I mean essentially you can I mean uh, that that is definitely um, an increase in efficiency right um, but I, I could have my counter argument as well saying that um, well if they can choose not to distribute for I, for IDEX then they can um, contact uh, any laboratory in in the in Canada directly and um, serve them as a distributor as well. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. No, I mean you can disagree with me, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to counter argue your your idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, but um, I mean, if you can find evidence that being under the same umbrella, that would intensify competition. And you can go back into the past and say five years and you say, look, um, the, the, actually the, um, the cost of distribution has going downhill and the, the, the end, I mean, at the end of the day, the price of these BOC diagnostic products decreased because this is more efficient or just because these um, distributors are more competitive or what. You can also argue for that as well, right? And that is that is that is equally valid. All right. And yeah, so as, as you can see, right, you now, now you see sort of like the approach and um, in, well, in, in, in our context, if you look at this market chair, I think um, in this case, you can look at the, um, the section 50, which is, I mean, if you look at the um, Thai Competition Act and um, it is, well, it is, it could be considered as the abuse of dominance, right? Because if you look at the sequence, this is like, Okay, uh, the first thing is, are you constitute a monopolization, right? And then the second thing say that, um, do, you, do you do something bad? Or does index conduct have an anti-competitive impact? Which essentially are the components of Article 50, right? Um, but in, in our our context, we have a very rigid definition of the dominant player, who is essentially you have to um, have a market share greater than fifty percent. Okay, so that that's that's uh, that's what it is, and you have to be larger than um, your sales last year has to exceed um, billion baht, which in this case definitely, I mean, I look in in the context is is um, way, way surpassed the level, all right? Um, one point, can we settle the case in the context of um, Thai Competition Act? Um, my quick guess is that no. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, why? Good. Um, because if you look at abuse of dominance, it has a criminal charge, right? Um, the question is, um, when when it does it and it is not something that it can be settled, 
when the question the, the point is when it occurs then you need to bring the case to the court but um, I would like to point out uh, section 79 if you look at the competition act this is quite a special um, section actually if you look at um, section 79 of the competition act what does it say And the next question is, could we use um, Section 79 to settle the case? You found Section 79. Yep. It reads, for all offense under this act, the Commission shall have the power to settle cases. In executing such power, the Commission may assign a Secretary General to act on the Commission's behalf. Oh. And like in the second paragraph is like when the alleged person pays the fine for the amount of settlement within the required period, it shall be deemed that the case is terminated under under the provisions of the criminal procedure code. And the amount of fine to settle cases will be like has to be determined by the commission's notification. So we need maybe need to look to the further notification that came out later. Yes, and there's still none so far. But um, in, in principle, it's sort of like, it is not exactly the same as the settlement, right? But, um, and one of the main reasons is because usually um, you don't, you don't, I mean, there's no criminal charge in this, and I mean, for the abuse of dominance, you don't, you don't normally apply that in the US. Okay, but in Thailand, it's explicit to say that, okay, for Article 50 and Article 54, this abuse of dominance and the collusion have um, criminal charges, right? So that, that is a slight difference here. And uh, this behavioral remedies is something that's quite interesting because there's no well, you can put it, um, there's no sort of scope or guidelines whatsoever on how uh, the, the uh, competition commission should impose this behavioral remedies. And this is quite interesting. I mean, uh, in this case, they use this behavioral remedies. And by nature, you, you don't have any other choices, right? Because you, can't, you cannot use structural remedies because there is no change in structure. It was just a change in the conduct. So I think that that's something that um, in, 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 in our context, I mean, the entire competition acts, you still need certain level of um, improvement when it comes to this uh, clarity on uh, behavioral remedies. All right. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, good job. Uh, I think it's so interesting. And I highlight this because, as I say, this is um, this idea was basically in 1950, 80, 85, right, which was almost like 30 ish years already. And as you, if you have had a chance to look at the the article that I I put in a suggested reading list, it was like a review of hundred year of the U.S. antitrust law. And one point today, they, I mean, that you can take away from it is there has been, I mean, there have always been changes in the way that the, uh, the FTC approaches cases, especially this vertical restraint has been changing all the time. Well, the, the, there, was, there was a period um, during which they were so strict when it when it comes to um, this vertical restraints, but sort of more recently they they become more sort of like lenient in a sense like yeah if you can prove that efficiency increases then it should be okay, right? Even even if you you impair the the ability of rivals to compete. So yeah. All right. Um, that's good. 
Um, are you ready? The next one. Um, yes. Uh, do you want to share yours or? Uh, share let, let me try first. Okay. Um, can you see the slide? Yes, I can. Okay. <clears throat> so, the case me and Gushi with brought to be discussed today took place in United Kingdom. is about a company called Casio Electronic Call Limited or Casio UK, which is the case in digital piano and digital keyboard sector. Um, first of all, I think we might want to um, define some uh, term. Okay. Before we um, okay, so first of all, uh, after this, we will be using some abbreviation so that uh, you may not like confuse after this. A, uh, the case is in UK, right? So uh, it is a decision made by the uh, Competition and Market Authority, which we'll call CMA. Okay. And, and this involves uh, mainly two laws, which is the Competition Act of 1998 of UK. Uh, we might, be, might call it the Act or CA 98. And also Article uh, 101 of Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, or and we will call it TFEU. Yeah, yeah. and the policies in which uh, they investigate is the Casio pricing policy that they uh, use the recommend selling price and we will uh, later call it RSP. Yeah, and that's it. So Mr. Tanawa will continue with the background. Um, so first of all, I would like to go through the backgrounds of the firm and also the market. Um, so you might have heard of Casio already. Casio is quite famous and Casio Electronic or Casio UK is a subsidiary of Casio Japan. The Casio UK is a UK based business that is active in the supply of Casio products, including but not limited to just electronic musical instrument or EMI in the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. The musical, the musical instrument sector in UK was worth around 400 million pounds in 2017 and 18. And the keyboard, piano and organs made up 10% to 20% of that 400 million pounds in the 2017 and 18. And the Casio UK is a process a turnover of over 50 million pounds in the same years. So what what does the Casio UK sell? The Casio UK sell currently the digital pianos, the digital keyboards, and the accessory for those instruments that include piano, piano and all keyboard stand and power adapter. But how does the Casio UK sell? They sell primarily via a network of resellers in the UK by using the following distribution channel as mass market reseller, independent reseller, comprising music dealer, socket, and open, and also the distributor and education, which is the sale will take place directly to the customer. So, the next part is the market definition. Mm -hmm. uh Okay, uh, for the market definition, right? First of all, uh, we need to know why CMA needed to, to define the market in this case. And uh, according to uh, the law used in this case, which is chapter one of uh, the Act and Article uh, 101 of TFEU, the CMA is not obliged to, de to define the real market unless it is impossible to de determine whether it has a negative effect on the competition. Uh, this principle is used in the Volkswagen case and SVO and others case. And 
Also, in this case, the CMA considered it is not necessary to reach a definition for this case, which uh, uh, they also use the same approach in the case of uh, Gauss Limited and Little Wood. However, the CMA uh, re required the definition so that they can calculate the Casio UK uh, relevant turnover, which affect by the uh, the pricing policies, so that they can uh, calculate the financial penalties. So uh, we will first talk about the upstream, which is the supplier. The supplier in this case is mainly Casio UK, and the product which is supplied is digital panels and digital keyboard, in which uh, Casio UK uh, segmented it into three and two sections. However, in this case, CMA uh, find that the Casio pricing policy, which is uh, which CMA considered an infringement, covered all, all of it, and it's in, entirely so that uh, CMA find that the relevant uh, product market is the supply of digital piano and keyboard, uh, which means all of it. And another part uh, in which uh, we need to describe is uh, the definition, which CMA consider that the market should be further subdivided in the uh, by the distribution channels. Uh, Normally, CMA would not define it, uh, define a separate market for a different reseller. Uh, however, in this case, they use the the key uh, sorry the key question to define it in this way is that the condition of competition dif differ significantly between different reseller groups. And as you can see, there are mainly three uh, distribution channel right the the mass market reseller, the independent resellers, and the education channel. Uh, uh, according to the evidence, the CMA find that the education channel uh, has the consumer purchasing to this channel is uh, less likely to consider purchasing through another channel so that uh, from this uh, from this finding, it can imply that even uh, so, uh, sorry, it can be implied that the product uh, purchasing to this channel cannot uh, cannot be like competitive and or substitute for another channel. So that CMA include only the mass market and the independent channel, not the educational one. Uh, for another part, which is the geographic market, the key question for this part is that a uh, the, the geographic market is narrower or wider than the whole UK. And according to the pricing policies applied uh, on the products, the CMA find that it's applied to all the product in U in UK in its entirely and the also the pricing and product availability do not differ according to the geographical uh, uh, location so that the Roman market is at least as wide as the UK and uh, for the second part is whether it is it would be considered wider than UK or not. CMA find that uh, there have been a change in the pricing policies, which is, which is from Casio UK and Casio Japan subsidiary in UK, so that they will adopt the same policies uh, to the uh, products in, in, Europe and, in Europe entirely. So that in this point, they, are, uh, they suggest that may have been wider than UK, However, the CMA considered only 
the Casio UK approach in for the pricing policy in the primarily uh, in the in the initial period, which is in UK only, and also uh, they also follow the same decision made by European Commission in 2003, which consider that uh, the geographic coal market need to be determined by country by country basis and differences in taste and tradition are considerable. So that they come to a conclusion that CMA uh, defined the geographic market is in the UK only. Um, for the next part, I would like to discuss about the engagement of Casio UK in resource price maintenance or RPM. But first of all, I would like to talk about the definition of RPM first. So, what is exactly resource price maintenance? Resource price maintenance is where a supplier and a retailer agree that the retailer will not resell the supplier's products below a specific price. Recommended resale price or RRP, which is different from RPM, to retailers are not RPM. If the retailer can still resale at a price it wants and there are no threats or financial incentives for sticking to RRP. Um, so, in the agree agreement between Casio UK and retailer number one, uh, the agreement state that the retailer one would not advertise or sell these pianos or keyboards supply to the retailer one by Casio UK, which is the relevant products we have discussed. Below a certain minimum price specified by Casio UK from time to time in accordance with the Casio pricing policy. And the law that can be applied to this issue, I think, is the Competition Act 1998 or CA 98 Chapter 1. On the subsection 1B, it prohibits, prohibits in certain circumstances, agreements, and conduct which prevent, restrict, distort competition within the United Kingdom. And subsection 2A, directly or indirectly fix purchase or selling price or any other trading conditions. And also the TFEU Article 101, which focus on the activity of an undertaking. The concept of an undertaking cover any entity engaged in an economic activity, regardless of its legal status and the way in which it, it is financed. And the section one of the TFEU article 101 um, has some characteristic, the same characteristic with the CA 98, subsection 2A which is um, it prohibits a directly or indirectly fixed purchase or selling price or any other trading condition. Um, to determine whether an agreement, that agreement between Casio UK and Resident number one, we will use a sufficient degree to harm the competition within UK, we might consider, consider the following factors. First, the content of its provisions. Second, its objectives. And the last one is the economic and legal context of which it forms a part. The contents of, a, of an agreement between Casio UK and Resolver number one that I would like to focus is that it stipulates that Resolver one would not advertise or sell relevant product or lie below the minimum price in accordance with Casio pricing policy. And it shows the Resolver one commitment to adhere to the casual pricing policy. And there's a tool or software from Casual UK that they use to monitor the market. I mean, this software they use to monitor the market, they will give to other seller. And the last one in the contents is equitable threats of sanction. Based on the remark from UK that the resident one would not be looked on as supporting Casio if it does work with Casio UK pricing policy. And the second one is the objective of the agreement. 
the majority of the agreement between Casio UK and Resident number one was to fix a minimum price as with the reseller one and also the other reseller uh, among the U UK that adhering to the Casio pricing policy would sell the relevant products online. And the last one is economic and legal context. The CMA has considered that the legal and economic context in which the relevant products are supplied mean that a restriction on, a, on the price at which can be advertised also online restricts competition by its very nature. Also, the decision I think is based on the ever increasing importance of internet at retail channel. Uh, but I did skip to the at the price and the product pricing at one or main factor based on which user compete. For the reasons set out above, the same a conclude that the agreement had at its object to prevention, restriction, or desertion of competition through the application of resource payments in, in the supply of living products within the United Kingdom. Um, and the last part would be will be verdict, and the CMA issue a decision that Casio is influence competition law by engaging in user price maintenance, and the CMA import a fine of around four hundred million pounds. As as the Ajibet parent company of Casio Electronic Co. or Casio Japan. At in relevant periods, Casio Computer Co. Limited is jointly and solely liable for Casio Electric Co. Limited fines. But the fine that include a 20% discount to reflect saving due to the company admission and their cooperation with the CMA under settlement agreement. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, interesting. Again, um, any points, questions, or comments from um, the other group? Well, um, um, I have like a question um, about the fact that the UK has now leave the EU, so. Will the decision be any different if um, if it is considered like this year after Brexit? You asked me or you asked the other guy? Um, the friend. <laughs> Do you want to yeah. try? Um, I, I think I need to pass the question to Ajahn. What you... You bows it to me. Uh, yeah, I, I think essentially, essentially it would not be that different because if you look at the Competition Act uh, 1998 and the uh, TFEU Article 101, um, content-wise they are, well, they are essentially the same. Right? They're essentially the same. So, um, but. Um, the thing is this. Okay, any other points? So I think I think it would not, it would be indifferent. Just um, and one of the main reason I answer that way is because if you look at the way that they were, I mean, arguing about the market definition, they were they were thinking about whether it should be the European market or the UK market, right? If the uh, the argument covers um, the European market, that's one thing. That uh, because this case is says that uh, it should not be going beyond uh, the UK market. So, if the market the definition is essentially the same, and that is within the scope of the UK, so uh, I don't think it's it will change anything, especially when it comes to this jurisdiction. Uh, I I have a question. Um, yes. Do you think that Brexit um, uh, is the reason why the CMA has decide that the um, the rural market is only in the UK because I think the Casio Japan has the same policy for the whole 
Euro continent? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to say, right? Uh, when when was the verdict? When was it? It was uh, uh, what? Uh, 2019. 19, right? So that was. I don't think so. Um, I know that um, that was. I think that was during the Theresa May already, right? Or oh, even as that was like when when Boris came already actually. So, I mean, um, the the full ex the full Brexit was just materialized. I just when uh, I think it was in December. Or it's just one or two months ago. So I don't think it it was that sort of like definite back then. And uh, I mean, above all, it should not really affect uh, the way that they the CM would, would investigate a case to be honest but uh, I don't know I, I don't think so I think I think uh, they don't really um, it might be a part of it uh, but uh, it's going to be hidden anyway but um, they said it explicitly right that um, I think it's from the case of Yamaha right Yamaha say that um, well uh, what what is it in that case what was the product in that case because you refer to it, right, Yamaha and yeah, PO and Yamaha. What 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 was what was it? It is like the elect electronic music instrument as well, or it was something else. I don't know. Mm, give me a second. <laughs> oh. But I think it's just quite like. Yeah. Yep. And uh, what are you going to say? I don't know. I think it's, it should be in the music industry. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, Any other points from the other group or? Well, I mean, I've read that the resale price maintenance is quite prohibited in the UK and as well as in the EU. So is there any chance that, I mean, the respondent can defend itself from the accusation? Good point. Do you think? Um, can can we say that the the pricing policy from Castle UK is only for like digital pianos and in the market the distributor still sells the stand or the other accessory as well. So if we argue that the Pricing policy only applies to the digital pianos, but they still give the right um, to the distributor to set the price of the accessory as as high or as low as they want to compete against each other. Is 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 this um, argument gonna help them get away with the accusation of resale payments in them? <clears throat> okay. Um, what do you think? I think one thing is they may use like instead of imposing the duty on the reseller to fix the price, 
they may like give like a recommended minimum price instead, like to not appear as too forcing. So RRP, right? That's what they call. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just this, this discuss these two points for now then. Um, the, the first thing is about the, the other accessories, right? There, there are some other things that are stand, say, the leather case and what um, the, the Hoover specifically designed for a piano. All these things are possible, but the, the, the question is, um, well, okay, you have to go back to this is the very point of why. So why at all do you need to fix the price of um, of of the of the of the keyboards or these um, electronic pianos at the very beginning? Why do you need to do that and allow um, these retailers to to Manip to change the price of other accessories. Why do you need to do that? Is there any benefit from doing that? I I know that you argue that okay, this what if this is possible? Would it be okay? The question is why is this okay? What 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 is good about it? So there are two parts, right? The first thing is um, what is good about fixing the price to a certain level, and the second is okay, what what's the benefit of um allowing a, I mean, these retailers to, to change the price of the accessories. Um, to ensure that no, nobody will be doing like price cutting acts maybe? Mm, you mean like predatory pricing? Um, I'm not sure if, if, if like, like for example, if if there's only a, like a, if uh, all the retailers are only allowed to to sell like to the lowest, like let's, let's say like one hundred dollars is the lowest they can sell a keyboard. Um, this would ensure that like because there are other competitors in the market, nobody's gonna like intentionally cut their price to eighty so that all the consumers will flood to buy from them and like create some kind of unfair advantage for them, like for the other competitors in the market. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it makes sense. Yeah, I understand. But um, yeah, again, um, so that is the first bit where right? you say that um, you don't want people to undercut prices. Yeah. So my subsequent question, my follow up question is basically why? What was bad about it? Because everybody's gonna end up selling for at like a a price that would not um, allow them to be profitable. Mm -hmm. Just to just to attract consumers. Well, but that that is their choice, right? I mean, uh, what what is bad about it? I mean. You, you sell it at lower prices and um, consumers enjoy the benefit of lower prices. Well, what's wrong about what, what's wrong with it? I mean, I think that sounds good to me. Um, because smaller, um, smaller distribute, I mean, smaller retailers who, ha who aren't able to compensate for that loss in in price for example from 100 to 80 like that that 20 dollar right there i don't think all retailers would be able to bear that loss but like really big real retailers for example they might be able to bear that loss by selling other products for example accessories at a high price and use that high price to compensate for the the 20 dollar loss from the undercut and still, at the end of the day, be able to to make like a large sum of money. But let's say re really small retailers who aren't able to to um, fix the price of accessories at at a price so high that it would be able to compensate for that twenty dollars lost. That would 
might might have to like go out of business or or just simply like not sell that product. All right. So there are, there are two points that I want to ask um, further. Um, the first thing is you say, would you say that there are some smaller, um, basically retailers or shops that might be unable to <clears throat> essentially um, cover the so cover the, the twenty dollar difference, right? The, the, that that difference is um, probably well. Um, so what what is your presumption in terms of cost now? What what is the level of cost? What is the, the level of cost of Casio um, sold these um, for example PNO? What is the initial cost that these uh, retailers paid um, to Casio? Eighty or hundred or what? Or sixty? Well, probably like sixty. So that they can, so that they can make a profit while selling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's okay because if you, if you recall, right, um, in the probably the very first lecture, I say that there are so many objectives of competition law, and one of those is the, the protection of smaller businesses. If you if you find that it's a valid objective for the competition law, and that is okay, and so many countries actually do that, um, you you allow this sort of behavior in order to guarantee that most retailers would. I mean, if you're more efficient, you may be um, having higher margin, and that's good for you. But if you are well smaller and well, your cost is a bit higher than larger players. I would, I mean, to, to a certain extent, I should be able, you should be able to survive, right? And, and you say that, okay, um, this retail price maintenance would guarantee the sort of survival. If you can justify that, then maybe that is valid. But um, I mean, I could, I could argue against this as well, saying that um, if, you are, if, if you are not efficient, then you just exit the market. It, 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 it essentially the same market is the same argument when you when you talk about having this mom and pop shops right and when these um, convenience stores came and they ran out of business and so many people say we need to protect them and the counter argument for that is like well because they are much less efficient they just go out of market and do something else but uh, in the UK um, actually the so many communities within the UK were working to fight against these um, the chain convenience stores as well. They say that they're, go they're going to buy only from local shops. So uh, yeah, I mean that that's possible. But again, the second point: when you say that you allowed um, these shops to sell accessories in order to uh, basically to make up for the for the for the loss of profits that they um, could not acquire the retail price maintenance. Um, so this is actually contradicting to what we discussed earlier, right? Because it means that now when we talk about these accessories and you allow these accessories to, I mean, you allow these, I mean, their prices to be maybe higher than, or to be adjusted uh, arbitrarily. It should basically means that um, the, uh, the the retail price maintenance um, keep the price to be at quite relatively lower level, so that some shops need some compensation from the accessories, right? Um, or I, I misunderstand. And well, another point is some of these accessories are just essentially the equipment that you need to buy together with the the piano anyway, right? So if you remember, it's like you're buying this, um, this printers, and in, in, in so many cases, um, they would consider cartridge as a, as a necessary equipment and would be, con would be included in the same market anyway. What, what do you think? Am I making sense or I'm not making any sense at all? 
Yeah, I think it's very likely that, that the accessories will be included in the same market. So that might not be a good argument. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? Okay, first, this is the abuse of dominance, or it is a collusion case, or it could be both. I think it can be both. Because in this CMA, it was the it was the collusion, right? And uh, not not the hardcore one. If you look at the um, Tight Trade Competition Act, it's going to be um, Section 55, right? It's not Section 54 because they are in essentially in different markets. But could it be um, Section 50? Which is a case of abuse of dominance. Could it be? Or Or, oh, I mean, on the other way around, why wasn't it the case? Why, 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 why did um, CMA consider it under the, the realm of a collusion, but not abuse of dominance? Because if you look at this number, right, um, it's, a, it's a bit un unclear, but um, let's say that 53% is the market share of the, uh, is the sales of the turnover of, of Casio, right? And, um, you say that 444 million was the was the was the market size of the uh, musical instrument sector in the UK. Then, well, the turnover will be lower than that. And you say that keyboards and pianos and organs, which are mainly the the the, the main products of um, Casio UK. I counted for 10 to 20 percent of the musical instrument sector. So even if you, you treat this, uh, I don't know how they measure this 444, but uh, 10 to 20 percent of it is going to be 40 to um, 40 to 80 million, right? And that's 53 would be about roughly 60 to 70 percent of the market share. And they, so it basically means that they are so big. Is this correct? And if you think about it, um, this case is not just a musical instrument, but it's the electronic musical instrument, EMI which is a subset of the musical instrument, and you have even less players, right? Um, well, you have Steinway, you have all these brands for pianos, but they, 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 don't, they don't produce these um, electronic musical instruments, or they don't produce that many, right? So um, the, market, the market even more concentrated when it comes to this electronic musical instrument. So the, the point is, could it be abuse of dominance? And if it is, then what happened? Or we just left it out or, or what? So it's just asking this group, did they consider the case of the, um, whether Casio was the dominant player or um, a monopolist or not? Did they consider the issue or they did not even mention about it? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, according to the CMA, they said that like uh, they only said about the 
uh, the industry, they said that uh, this uh, musical instrument is not like it is not a does not have a dominant nationwide chain of musical instrument stores, but like another like uh, almost all the part of the the case they, they didn't mention like a belong dominant at all. All oh, right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So um, if that is the case, well, can can I say that? Um, well, what if I ask this question? If it is, suppose you imagine the situation where um, you have these um, distribute, well. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about this um, resellers, right? Um, for example, if Casio is not that big of the player, and Casio provides this retail price maintenance agreement, not provide, but um, force you to sign this retail price maintenance, do you think you would need to sign it? Or you can say, no, I, I don't. I don't need to sign it. Maybe no, since like, since as you said that if Casio is, or, uh, and small right, you you mean small player right, so that is mean that the reseller could have buy another like another brand instead. Okay, so it basically means that by nature, um, in order for certain um, company or business operator to to sort of impose this retail price maintenance on another party, you should really have this sort of bargaining power to a certain extent, right? If, if you have to impose, so there are two possibilities now, right? Uh, the first thing is you you sort of need to impose it on the other party, right? That that sort of you force force it mm -hmm. to another party. Another party has no choice. And another scenario is sort of like you. Well, actually, it win win for you because, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to charge a higher price, and at the same time, you're gonna get more of your uh, margin as well. You think in this case, in this case, which one is the case? The first scenario or the second scenario. First is you have to force it. The second is actually the win-win situation. Uh, I think, uh, as you as you have said, I think it's have possibility that it could be both. But uh, I I do not have like enough information to. Uh, to decide whether in in this particular case it is which case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one thing that probably you need to prove is, well, um, you. I mean, look. Um, suppose you are Casio, right? Suppose you are Casio, and you you have to tell your reseller okay so let's start from scratch right you all you are casio and you would like um, your reseller to set certain level of price what is which level of price is for your base benefit it should be high or it should be low as, as a as casio Okay, um, I'll put it more explicitly. So, for, for example, you you were about to answer, right? Please, please, sorry. Um, uh, uh, just, no, no, please continue, please continue. Uh, suppose that two scenarios again, okay? You are Casio, and you you have to choose between like, okay, uh, you, you, 
you talk to your reseller, right? And you'll say, okay, I would like you to set the price at 120. All right, uh, that's the price that I guarantee that you, you, you should set and you sell it at the level and I'm going to sell it to you at 100. So you're going to get half 20 margin. That's the first scenario, right? Um, the resale price is like 120 and I'll, I'll sell you as a wholesale at, at 100 and you enjoy this 20 uh, margin. And, and the, the alternative is, I, I'm give you, well, you can set the price arbitrary, but um, well, it could be 100. And well, actually my cost is lower than 100, so I'll sell it, I'll give you 80, for example. Right, I'll give you 80, for example, and you're gonna get, you're gonna enjoy margin at 20 again. And now I'll, I'll get just 80 from you instead of 100. If you are Casio, which one is more preferable? Uh, the second one. Oh, I'm not sorry. The the first one, for Casio, right? right. Yes, you <laughs> you you want the price to be higher, right? And well, definitely. Um, if for example, well, you can actually do better, right? Um, uh, in the case you can say that you know what if you if you sell it at hundred twenty, um, you know if you sell it at hundred, I could give you just eighty because my cost is like not that that lower than that. But suppose you can sell at 120, I could give you even more margin because now I can I can actually have 20 extra as well, and I will charge you just just 90, so you now enjoy 30 level like 30 margin, right? And both of us is actually better because I can have 10 extra and I give you another 10 extra for your margin. So basically, it means that instead of charging 100, if you are I mean if you are working with the market price of for, for example uh, you sell at 120 and now you have and then let's share like 50 50 percent of the the 20 extra margin that we can acquire you get what i meant mm, yeah yeah so this agreement is essentially uh, for mutual benefits right Um, I, from my understanding, I, I think the resale price mechanism is only benefits the Casio UK because it will just only have Casio UK to, but to guarantee the, the gross sale they will get. I mean, I, I think that, um, from my perspective, I think, um, electronic piano or keyboards are are not that um, it's not an essential product I mean people just not buy it every day so Casio UK just use this RPM agreement just to ensure their sale that okay uh, this year I, I can produce like 100,000 and I can ensure that the these hundred thousand piano will be so yes okay so you say that the agreement was made in order to create or the byproduct of it is also to create certainty right so you 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 set the price and you know at this level of price um my margin would well essentially uh, my margin would increase and even if I say at um, lower in terms of, I mean, quantity, but um, if I pre-calculate it and I think it's worth it, but that is possible as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, um, this is much more difficult to occur, right? If you think about it. Um, it basically means that um, this is why this my, my point here is this um, Casio should have certain level of negotiation power. But um, the thing is that this is not 
if it is just like um, the case in which one party wins and another loses, then you need some sort of negotiation power on the on the side of the winner to force the loser, right? But when this is a this sort of mutual benefit, you can make an argument. I mean, make an agreement amongst yourself. Hmm. Uh, so you mean uh, Casio and have to be at least equal uh, in the equal position to the reseller or higher, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. So what I'm trying to point out is um, because my initial question was basically, um, could it be abuse of dominance, right? Could it be, um, could be, it be any other wrongdoings like uh, unfair trade practice? Right. Could it be the Casio is actually using its um, dominant position to force another party? Well, I, and you say that, yes, it's possible. But I'm trying to point out the distinctive nature of this um, collusion that uh, well, collusion occurs when actually you can compete against each other or not competing against each other. But you, you, you is this pretty much your choice whether you would enter into this agreement or not, but you feel that well, by entering into disagreement, it benefits you more. So you decide that, okay, let's do disagreement, right? And that is, you see the difference here. When when it becomes like your mutual benefits and, well, I, I mean, surely at an expense of the, of the consumers, but um, that is the very nature of this restraint, this agreement, which is quite um, different from the case where you unilaterally um, exercise your market power, right? So it could be both, I mean, if you, if you consider. Um, I, um, now I'm pretty sure that Casio UK is, a, is, in, is in a dominant position because as in the content of the agreement, I can see that there's a threat. Say that um, the reseller did, and it's not just the reseller number one, and there are also the other reseller as well. Um, the content agreement say that they will get it, like any support or will be looked on at. Um, not conforming to the pricing policy from Casio UK. Can, can we say that it is the characteristic of like dominant payer in the market? Because it's, I think it's kind of show us that the Casio UK is in the higher state that they can like dwell their only seller. Yeah, I mean, it can. I mean, if you want to show, I think. I think essentially, I'm just trying to point a difference. But um, well, if you can prove that Casio is the dominant player, and it imposes a sort of um, well, retail price maintenance, it forces you. Um, but the, but the, the thing is this: uh, it is unfair in the sense that um, could could it the reseller do better? Right. If you if you think about the previous case, um, which is the case of this, um, well, exclusive dealing. The, the you see the difference here, right? In the case of exclusive dealing, it means that actually um, your your retailer, or your reseller, your retailers could actually um switch to some other players as well in order to get a better deal. Right, but um, this is like you force that your players do not have any other alternative. In that case, it's, it's quite clear that um, that is the case of abuse of dominance. But in this case, it it is this sort of like yeah, uh, let's make an uh, let's make the, this arrangement, this concerted arrangement, and say that we're gonna increase the price so that both of us could enjoy. Yeah, you see the level of sort of like level playing field here and um, the the distinctive the distinction between um, uh, section 50 which is the abuse of dominance and uh, section 54 which is the 55 sorry uh, which is the the soft car collusion right 
right? And um, I think the market. Oh, so, yeah, so the article fifty-five of the Thai Competition Act, right? Yes. Um, I looked on the OTCC website and I found that there's the in in order to determine whether it is soft core or hard core, I think the um. Seller association decision also counts as well. Yes. Um. Uh, so, so can. So it is. It's kind of like can go both way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, um, I think the whole difference is this. Um. If you think about it, is the abuse of dominance is like Casio, the way the Casio treat um, these retailers, right? Resellers. Um, but when it comes to this um, collision, is essentially the agreement and the impact of this agreement on consumers. But I mean, eventually, both of them affect the um, consumers. But if you look at um, section 55 and subsection 1, you see that um, if you fix the price, right? If you fix the price amongst the business operators who are not competing in the same market, and in this context, this is Casio is the supplier, right? And they have other suppliers, of course. And then another another market is the distribution market, which is another separated one, right? They're not competing against each other. And uh, that is simply my, what it means by vertical um, restraints. Um, I'm sorry, it's like if is if the situation is going to fall, fall into the soft call one, mm -hmm. um, that might be only just like Casio and just Wizzle one, right? And but they, they just like share the the higher sale, like it's a win-win situation from my understanding. Yes. Um, but if there are also other resellers, like hund hundreds of them, and the the resale financing agreement um, are different in each one of them. Like this resale one are like are not in the state that can um that like they are like small store and the big one so is it in the case of the Casio UK and the small one is will be the abuse of dominance is that correct well uh, what, what, what <clears throat> sorry uh, what I say is this, um, we could be big. It could be the big one as well, right? Uh, because if you look at the abuse of dominance, what it says is this, right? It says that, well, if you look at um, Article Section uh, 50, it says that okay, given that you are a dominant player, right? And well, if you, in, well, um, in this case, um, you. The, 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 the subsection one is not applicable here because um, you're not really fixing the price of, of your products, right? But you, the, the one that is applicable here and potentially applicable is the subsection two, right? If you impose an unfair condition for another business operator, which is a trading partner in order to limit, and this is going to be limit sale of goods, right? So, um, <clears throat> the question is whether this is unfair. I mean, and this is actually you look at the both both parties. Well, it could be it could be correct if you say that uh, the smallers were forced to do this. But um, the thing is, is whether it's unfair. Because this is possible that this is actually um, this is this could be good for smaller actually because it is 
I mean, say that you set the retail price at the same level, regardless of the size of the resellers. The smaller one should be the one who benefit more, right? Because your cost is, well, your cost is relatively higher. And if you if you allow resellers to set the price arbitrarily, it is quite likely that the, the bigger player will set the price at the at the level where smaller resellers can't compete. Yeah. So so, okay. So to conclude, basically, you can consider both um, section fifty as section um, fifty five. And in this case, to me, um, I think it's reasonable why um, the the CMA doesn't consider. They did not consider um, this this abuse of dominance, and mainly it is because it's not just the condition of one side and impose on another side, but because this is sort of an agreement that both of them benefit from, right? And that is that is what the section fifty five, I mean, was um, written for, which is the the vertical agreement to restrain um, competition, and in this case, it's a fixed price. This is clear. Yes. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So um, that's it. I mean, good job, uh, both groups. I mean, I, 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 I do, I do learn a lot as well, and I, I want. I think. I think I. I, I don't know, but I hope you learn as well. I mean, discussing cases is something that's very interesting. So, um, would you like to um, switch a member of your group for the upcoming week if you haven't started the, um, the preparation for the next week? Could I mix you up a bit? Yeah, I don't mind. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to keep rotating then. Um, so uh, I'll just I'll just randomly choose um, because the upper left with the lower right and so on my screen. So it's now what you will be working with Prawa in the upcoming session and uh, Prim, you work with um, with Shavit for the upcoming lecture. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And the the next lecture it will be uh, it will be case study again, which is great. Uh, it will be the horizontal restraints. And in this case, essentially, as the um, the cartels, right? So um, let's see how it goes. So um, again, the next week. Lecture is not a holiday, right? It's not on the holiday. It's on the the fourth. No, the fifth. Yes, the fifth of March. And again, I look forward to have your slides um, within Wednesday. Okay. Any points or any suggestions for the next week, or what do you want to do differently? Um, do you prefer like having case from other jurisdictions other than US and UK? <laughs> Why? I don't know. Maybe like to explore different. Yeah, that would be lovely. I mean, why not? Why not? Uh, we, we could be open minded and discuss because competition law is essentially very country specific. Yeah, from Japan, from uh, India, from uh, Israel, all these countries are going to be very interesting as well. In Germany, I give a hint that Germany approaches um, cartel in a very, very unique way. And it's going to be interesting. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, see you next week. Thank you for today. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.